think we're on. Okay. Welcome to the Bible Baptist Church of Metro Toronto. Um, uh, Sunday that we're really celebrating uh, July 1st, the uh, Canada Day, and um, happy Canada Day. <clears throat> we're, uh, sort of doesn't seem like Canada Day. A lot of things going on and can't do too much, but um, hope uh, you can enjoy the long weekend, Monday off, or something with family, whether you're at home or maybe make it to the park and Keep your social distancing and all that. <clears throat> we just, uh, trust it'll be a good weekend. We're uh, today. <clears throat> we're we're going to be uh, talking about something maybe you can use for a picnic. We'll be talking about salt. And uh, Jesus says something about salt. Every Christian should know about. And uh, it's in Matthew chapter five, thirteen says, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt have lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out, to be trodden under foot of men. So it looks like there's a, uh, a uh, directive for us to be salt. <clears throat> Let me talk about what that salt is. Um, First thing I want to point out about this salt. Well, before we get in, let's go, Lord, in prayer. Well, we come before you. Thank you, Father, for this uh, this morning. Lord, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Thank you for salvation that's provided free and clear to all who will come by faith. Uh, Lord, for thank you for the enlightenment that you've given us to understand the difference between the darkness and the light, lie and the truth. Uh, thank you for giving us uh, understanding and wisdom in knowing who you are <clears throat> according to your word. And so, Father, we just pray for uh, this morning's message that bless me to be a blessing to others. Pray, Father, for uh, those who are not sure about their salvation, not sure if they're have a guarantee of going to heaven because they truly don't understand the gospel. Pray that they would get saved today. Lord, help me be your servant today through your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> First thing I want to point out is uh, the need. The need for the salt of, in the earth or the salt of the earth. Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. And if we know our Bible, if we go too far into it, realize that this earth is cursed. There's a curse on this earth after the fall of man, um, <clears throat> after man's sin against God. God pronounced the curse upon the man, the woman, the serpent, and even the earth. And uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 says, and unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow thou shalt eat of it all the days of thy life. Thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground. For out of it wast thou taken. For dust thou art, and dust shalt thou turn. Now, <clears throat> that's a very uh, brave uh, pronouncement by the Lord. But it really is very significant when we look at our life. Again, we're talking about the need for the salt. And we're looking at this, uh, what's the need? Why? Why? Uh, and we'll talk about what the salt really is for, but um, we need to look at the condition uh, and, and see the condition and the need first before we're ever going to see the, the value in the, uh, in the remedy. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, we can see that God has already said the life for mankind is going to be filled with toil and grief 
And uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it's one of the wisdom books, it's called. The book of Ecclesiastes uh, is uh, written by uh, King Solomon. And Solomon was the richest, the uh, Bible says, wisest, um, influential man in the world at that time, at the time it was written. And there was nothing that he couldn't have. There was nothing he couldn't do uh, and enjoy. I mean, if anyone's, anyone was going to enjoy this life and have it all, it was Solomon. Reading about some of the money, that uh, the gold that they had, that they imported, as well as uh, uh, the uh, temple that he built. It's just um, figures are astronomical uh, in comparison to today's standards. So here's a man who had it all. And here's what he said in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, and verse 14. As I have seen all the works that are done under the, under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and vexation of spirit. That which is crooked cannot be made straight, and that which is wanting cannot be numbered. I commune with my own heart, saying, Lo, I come to great estate, and have gotten more wisdom than all they that have been before me in Jerusalem. Yea, my heart had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I gave my heart to know wisdom, and to know madness and folly. That means he every extreme of of pleasure you can say he had. I perceive that this also is vexation of spirit. For in much wisdom is much grief, and in the increased knowledge increaseth sorrow. Wow. What a sad commentary on life. He continues on his real admission of really no sensible gain in life. And he says in chapter 2, in verse 11, it says, Then I looked at all the works that, I, that my hand had wrought, and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. There was no profit under the sun. He's looking at everything that he's accomplished, and he accomplished great. This is the golden age of Israel. And this man is coming up with this real dire depressing uh, commentary on, on life, his life. He goes on to really total despair. In chapter 2, verse 17, talks about uh, uh, his accomplishments that he made and how he can't um, guarantee they won't be corrupted down the road, he can't guarantee that they're going to be uh, um, continued or not wasted. In other words, everything he's going to build and everything he built, um, there's no surety for it. He says in, in chapter 2, verse 17, Therefore I hated life, because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous to me for all that is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor that I had taken under the sun, because I should leave it unto the man that should be after me. And who knoweth whether he shall be wise man or a fool? Yet... Shall he have rule over all my labor, wherein I have labored, and wherein I should I have showed myself wise under the sun? It's also vanity. Therefore, I went unto the, <clears throat> I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. Wow. You know, <clears throat> that reminds me of um, many uh, great people in life who've made achievements. And after their achievements, they were uh, they were disappointed in how they were received or how those uh, achievements were used. Um, for one, I just think of is uh, when the the uh, scientists and engineers who came up with television in the early 1900s. I mean, television really was developed. Uh, in the late 1930s and didn't really come on board to be really broadcast uh, say in a nationwide uh, setting till like the 1950s but those who were developing television after radio was the big thing they really had the idea that this was going to be uh, a great improvement for mankind <laughs> we could look back as, uh, almost a century uh, later and say yeah um, but it was they, they really felt like this was going to be improvement to educate people in such a great way. And they saw in those early days of television, they saw how it was being used for just folly, game shows, and 
just you know uh, soap operas and, and things of that nature and it wasn't used for what in their mind would be used to uplift man rather it was just to feed them junk in their mind uh, and that's what it was you know that's why they don't call it the boob tube for nothing right and now we're out of the internet which is a whole nother story but the thing is i'm saying sometimes people with great intellect and great ambition and great purpose plan things and accomplish things that are wonderful and we applaud them for it only to see it being used in a negative way for mankind and maybe even a negative way to what the, what the original purpose was and so that's grieving he says it's vexation of spirit in other words it's like a cur you feel like a curse on you and here's a Solomon Solomon everything I can accomplish he goes I can't guarantee it's going to stay the same. It's because someone else is going to take it over and going to corrupt it. Someone else is going to take it over and destroy it, waste it. What's the purpose? What's the purpose of what I'm doing? An accomplishment. Right? A lot of men are like that. A lot of men are looking for, you know, uh, um, you know men are usually risk takers and they want to build things and, and uh, they like the challenge. And, and, and it's part of the, the enjoyment is just getting your, the thick of... Uh, of uh, making something, accomplishing something, finishing something. <laughs> it's great to be able to finish something. But um, when, you, when you can look down the road and think, and you see that it's really not going to be either appreciated or doesn't really accomplish what you want it to accomplish, or it's not really uh, uh, useful anymore, you're like, well, what was the purpose? Why? Why did I do that? Well, it was fun for the time. Time's gone. You know, a lot of times what men will do, too, uh, knowing that that is uh, uh, that life has, doesn't have the certainty and uh, reward for all our labor that we're looking for, um, it, it's, we still fall into uh, trying to grapple with more and more and more and more. In other words, materialism. Materialism becomes the um, modus operandi. Especially here in the West. I mean, I think everyone has a, has a somewhat of an evil eye, always looking for getting and covetousness, and and you know the, the have-nots want what the haves have, and uh, so there's always this back and forth. And the haves got something, they're greedy, they won't share, and uh, that's universal. That's that's a wickedness of man's heart. Um, but <clears throat> materialism is real, and 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 sometimes it's looked at as the um, that's really my purpose in life. And that really is going to save me from the, this, this curse if I just get more. Um, it's a false hope. It's a false peace. It really won't give you peace. More and more and more will not. A bigger house won't make you happier. Uh, a, 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 more, a more late model car, a, a 2001 um, you know, Cadillac really won't make you happy. Oh, it'll be a fun to ride. Mm, first week, maybe month, it's over with. Now it's just another car. Uh, you know, uh, the, uh, uh, the things in life, materialism. Jesus said, he said, you cannot serve God and mammon. And he said that in Matthew chapter 6. In the same sermon where he's uh, preaching this sermon on the mount. He's saying, uh, you can't serve God and mammon. And mammon is a uh, false god. Jesus was referencing materialism as a god, as a false god. And he said, you can't serve the true and living God, the one true and living God, and serve the false money God. You can't serve them both. You're either serving one or you're serving the other. So I'm serving them both. A lot of times that's what we want to feel, we want to feel like. We want to feel like, especially here again, like in a very, most, in the most affluent uh, country in, in, in the, the world. Uh, we, 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 we say, oh, I'm going to serve God. And I'm going to make sure I don't take my eye off that, that uh, materialism. That's mammon. God says you can't do it. You're not serving God. Nope. You're serving money. You're serving the false god of money. That's the god of materialism. <clears throat> uh, there's a theologian, writer, uh, very well worth reading. His name's Martin Lloyd-Jones. And he said, he says, how they, how they tend to grip the whole personality and affect us everywhere. 
They demand our entire devotion. He's talking about things. Um, they want us to live for them absolutely. It sounds like your cell phone, right? This powerful view of the, world, of the dangers of materialism is not exclusively to evangelical Christians. That means us. He says, greed is the natural consequence of materialism. You live for materialism, he's saying, you'll be greedy. The humanistic psychotherapist Eric Fromm described it as, quote, a bottomless pit which exhausts the person in endless effort to satisfy the need without ever reaching satisfaction. Someone has likened the pursuit of the world's riches to gathering nuts. Bows are torn in getting them, teeth are broken in chewing them, and the stomach is never filled in eating them. That's materialism. Beautiful. It really looks at this, I mean, this life we're living, as much as we got to eat, <laughs> as much as we have to have clothes, as much as we have to live in houses, as much as we need transportation, as much as we, you can even say, need entertainment. There's really no lasting satisfaction in that. What's the answer? What the answer is? Salt. That's the answer. Salt. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of uh, sometimes, uh, well, uh, we buy this meat. We buy this meat at the store. It's uh, 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 organic. Organic uh, hamburger. They come already prepackaged and everything. And every time I cook that on the grill, I eat it. it. Tastes like sawdust. There's no flavor. I'm pouring ketchup on it. I'm putting mustard on it. I'm put a pickle in there. Um, yes, and even a little salt. You got to give it some flavor. Uh, it's it just tasteless, terrible. And uh, you know, sometimes life can be that way. The Christian is supposed to be the one that gives flavor and satisfaction to the world we're, we're supposed to be the salt um jesus answer is uh hey you're supposed to be the salt yeah there's an issue yeah there's a need but christian's supposed to be the salt the scriptural use of salt in other words in the bible as we see salt being used it was several ways as a matter of fact the Dead Sea is also called the Salt Sea, uh, which is a, uh, a body of water, inland body of water that um, from the Mediterranean that was filled, is filled with magnesium chloride and sodium chloride, which is salt. And uh, it's, a, it's a very unique um, uh, body of water. Uh, I've heard people who've gone in and swam in it, and they say, you, won't, you can't sink. You just sort of float on the top. I mean... Uh, we need to see that, but or, or experience that. But that's um, the salt sea. Uh, very common, and uh, Israel knew all about salt. They used it many times. They used it for newborn babies would be salted. They take salt and rub the body with salt. Um, meat offerings uh, in the uh, Old Testament were offered with salt. They had to have salt for the for the meat offering. In the, uh, in the book of Judges, we see a, one of the uh, uh, leaders in Judges, <clears throat> not really a good man, his name is Abimelech, and he goes in this one, takes this one city over called Shechem, and he destroys it, tears it down, kills the people, and he uh, sows the whole land with salt. What for? To make it barren. To make it barren. Um, and... Uh, <clears throat> As I said, with the with the salt being used in the sacrifices of Israel, um, it, it was it's actually had another uh, term called the covenant of salt. The covenant a covenant is an agreement, a promise, uh, a contract. And it's called the covenant of salt. It's like saying that God's saying, like I, here you're going to make this sacrifice, and the purpose of the sacrifice was the forgiveness of of the of the sinner's sin. He would bring a lamb, bull, a goat, a, a, a dove, <clears throat> some animal, clean animal that God would prescribe and say, and he'd offer it to God through the priest, and they would kill it, but they would use the, um, uh, the they take the meat and they would add salt to it. 
And the salt signified the contract. It signified a, this was a promise that God was making that their sins will be forgiven. And it, it's, uh, and it's, um, it's a done deal. So um, salt was understood to be that way. I'm going to just read the verse of Leviticus chapter 2, verse 13. It says, And every oblation and, and the, of thy meat offering shalt thy season with salt. Neither shalt thou suffer the salt of the covenant of thy God to be lacking from the meat offering. With all thine offerings thou shalt offer salt. So uh, <clears throat> again, <clears throat> excuse me, as Israel had this understanding of salt, Jesus says, you're supposed to be salt. Now, what's the significance? Of salt for the Christian we're not living in the Old Testament we don't have these these Levitical priests who take our lambs our bulls our goats that uh, or our cat or our dog and and uh, sacrifice them uh, for our sins no Jesus is the sacrificial lamb he uh, when when Jesus came and he died on that cross his <clears throat> death on that cross was the sacrifice the one true sacrifice that all those other sacrifices in the Old Testament signified and pointed to. See, they, they were just simple, simply like a, a snapshot picture, but they weren't really the actual thing. Uh, in, my, <clears throat> in my room, I have some pictures. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> in my office, I have several pictures. <clears throat> of people, friends, a wife, uh, grandkids. But, you know, and I look at them and it reminds me of, uh, of, the, of the real thing. Uh, but I don't go up there and hug that picture. <laughs> I mean, maybe if I, I would, maybe, but I don't. Because I know there's a, that's not the real thing. And the Old Testament sacrificial lamb <clears throat> and bull and goat that the Old Testament uh, uh, Levitical priests sacrificed on behalf of the people, was to just be a picture to show in the future that there would be the ultimate real deal, the real thing, and that was the Lord Jesus Christ when he died on the cross. For us now, we look back 2,000 years ago, and back then they looked forward. And uh, <clears throat> as a Christian, we, uh, we understand that, there, uh, that, these, uh, that these Old Testament teachings were, uh, were simply instructive to us to, to appreciate what we have in Christ. If you're not saved this morning, then you need to not trust, your, trust in any priest. Don't trust in any uh, uh, religion. Don't trust in your good works. As a matter of fact, that's why you need an offering to come before God, because your good works don't do it. The, the only worthy offering that you can present before the holy, true God is the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ died on your behalf, all you can do is put your faith and trust in what God has provided, the sacrifice he's provided on your behalf. Trust in him. Don't trust in self or anything else. But as the Christian, when we talk about, we're talking about salt, taking the salt, uh, what's the purpose of salt and how does it apply as a Christian? <clears throat> salt makes food more flavorful, right? You say, pass the salt. Why? Because you just got to make it Tastier. Uh, well, the Christian is supposed to be that way. Uh, you know, we should all be little salt shakers. <laughs> uh, maybe we should be shakers. Not, I'm not talking about the group, but um, salt shaker. We should. We people should shake us. Oh, now, now things are better. Uh, I can get in some examples of Christians doing that, but um, that's what Christians are supposed to be put in any environment, placed in any environment, and make it more. Uh, uh, tolerable and eat pleasant and maybe even joyful. That's our job. That's our job. If we're in that situation, things are miserable. My job as a Christian, your job as a Christian, make that a better place. Enjoyable. We should bring joy, peace, and the lives of others in this world. We should be an agent of peace among men. We should be peacemakers. They shall be called the children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers. <clears throat> the Bible calls it savor. Salt uh, must have savor. What is that? That means we need to, uh, we can't lose that. What, what is that savor? That savor is, is, is 
something that appeals to men. Now, we're not talking about being men pleasers. Uh, no, the Bible nowhere tells us that we should uh, put men above God, and, and really our service should be always looking to please men. On, on the contrary, many times we have to come contrary to man. <clears throat> but the thing is, we don't have to be contentious, <laughs> uh, uh, but we need to be um, up, upholding truth. See, because this, because truth and righteousness and holiness are really what brings peace and and brings peace and joy. Uh, you know, we don't need to be an entertainer. We don't need to be a uh, um, uh, placating and trying to uh, encouraging people, or I should say, uh, making, uh, you know, giving in to people's pity party and saying we're really helping them because we're, we're agreeing with their pity. No, no, no. We should get them out of it because there's no joy, there's no happiness, there's no peace staying in a little pity party. We need to be able to point them to truth and righteousness and holiness and hope, a future of hope. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Now, us as evangelical Christians, Bible-believing, fundamentalist Christians, we believe in soul winning. Usually we use that term, soul winning, as we're leading someone to Christ to trust him as Savior. And uh, that's, that's every Christian's uh, mandate to do that. Go into all the world, preach the gospel of every creature, and uh, um, call men to Christ, draw them to Christ. <clears throat> but uh, on our individual, that's what we should be doing, but on our individual basis, the only way we're going to be able to effectively do that not only be right with God and have the word of God, but be able to appeal to men. In other words, people have to be able to receive us before, if they're going to receive Christ. We have to be uh, uh, welcomed by them to receive our message we're going to share with them. So if we can win them over to us, we can, to, our, to listen to us. doesn't mean we have to be beautiful people. Doesn't mean you have to be the smartest people. Doesn't mean we have to be the uh, the richest people in town. No, but we have to be saying something, and doing something, and living something very appealing and very attractive that they don't have, and the world doesn't have it. We do. Christians do. That's why Jesus said, "Ye are the salt of the earth." He didn't say the educated crowd is the salt of the earth. He didn't say the politicians are the salt of the earth. He didn't say the uh, uh, entertainers are the salt of the earth. That's the way the world looks at it. They're always bumping around the night because they can't see straight. But so are the Christians. They don't realize it's our job to be the salt of the earth. It's our job to be making this dismal, cursed earth more habitable, more livable, more pleasant, more peaceful. And that's a, that's a challenge, but that's our job. You're the salt of the earth. We're the agents of peace. Also in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24, it says, A man that hath friends must show himself friendly. <clears throat> he that is a friend, and there's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. And that your, your best friend you can have is the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you ever serve anybody? Excuse me. A neighbor? A co-worker who's not your blood relative <clears throat> that you, <clears throat> excuse me that you are a friend to them that you are a friend to them like maybe more than even their relatives <clears throat> yeah blood is thicker than water huh <clears throat> not really not really maybe it should be but not really <clears throat> you can love people and you can be closer to them and more friendly to them and encouraging to them than even a relative. Would they probably naturally look to a relative for encouragement? But the Christians assaulted the earth. The Bible says, Mark the perfect, in um, Psalm chapter 37, verse 37, Mark the perfect man. That means <clears throat> um, 
Uh, take a look at him. Uh, behold the, the perfect man. Mark the perfect man. And the perfect man is not the perfect man who never makes a mistake. In the Bible, the word perfect means the man who's mature, the man who has understanding, the man who has uh, knowledge, the man who's um, complete even. Mark the perfect man and behold the upright. The end of that man is peace. See, this is the kind of person we should be, uh, a person who's bringing peace into this world. Proverbs 27, 16 says, Iron sharpeneth iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, um, <clears throat> I have a knife set my son gave me for, I think it was a Christmas present. And along with the knife set, there's this other um, steel uh, rod. And you take, when the knives get dull, you, you take them and you, you, you rub them against the, the steel rod. Steel against steel, stainless steel against the other steel. And it sharpens the, the knives. Uh, iron sharpens iron. That, and, is, and this is the picture, is that people are effective in helping and strengthening other people. God uses human instrumentality. You know, a lot of times people pray, oh, God use me, God use me, or God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. You know how God's going to bless you? With a person. A person to lighten your load. That's how God's going to bless you. No, 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 he's just going to make some unnatural circumstance happen in my life. Well, maybe. But uh, the, the way God prescribes the way he he's, does things is he uses people. Iron sharpeneth iron. And the sad thing is that many times people run away from people when they're in great need. They, 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 they just hibernate. They, they isolate themselves. Now, I know we have this isolation now, lockdown and all that. But we can still contact people. We can still we have the social media we're doing right now. And there's other avenues of, of communication. And we need, if, when we are, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself, okay? Because I know how this, this goes. <clears throat> because life can be very depressing. But the answer is not hibernating. Pray, yes. Get encouragement from the Lord. Read your Bible, yes. But get, but then get going and get with people. Get with people. Iron sharpeneth iron. But what's the sharpening for? It says, iron sharpeneth uh, iron, so a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. You know what? When you're with people, you look better. <laughs> you comb your hair, you brush your teeth, you shave, whatever. You fix yourself up real, make up whatever you do. This is half the battle. You want to really look good? You want to really do a makeover? Get around people that make you more uh, effective in life. Make you stronger in this life. Hang around those people. Communicate with them. Iron sharpens iron. We're supposed to be, Christians are supposed to be that sharpening person. We're supposed to be the salt in this world. Men influenced by the Spirit of Christ have been themselves salted with fire. The Bible says in Mark chapter 9, verse 49, it says, For every one that is salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt have lost its saltiness, wherewith shall it be salted or seasoned it? Um, have, ye, have ye salt in yourselves and have peace one with another? Uh, uh, when he says you'll be salted with fire, fire is a... Uh, a uh, <clears throat> A picture of judgment and every Christian who is going to be used to be salt to other people is going to be somebody who judges themselves God will judge listen Christian if you're going to be salt in this world as God says you're the salt it's you're the people that I'm using to make life better in this world then we're going to have to allow God to judge our hearts judge our motives and we're the ones who are willing to <clears throat> be used as salt. But we have to be judged first. Judged, salted with fire. <laughs> Judgment. 
and then were useful to be judged, to be used in other people's lives. Salt um, not only flavors up and makes things more pleasant, but salt permeates, becomes invisible, but it is sensed. I mean, you can taste it. You can taste the salt in it, but you don't see the salt. Maybe it's in the in the in the liquid. Maybe it's in the soup. Maybe it's in the, the on the hamburger. But uh, you don't um, you don't see the salt. It permeates. <clears throat> a Christian does not bring attention to himself. The Christian uh, keeps in the background. He always a Christian always should be pointing to Jesus Christ. And giving him the glory, not trying to boast of himself, his doing what he's doing, as good as it might be, as profitable as it is for the kingdom of God's sake, he doesn't put any attention on himself. He works in the background, doesn't look for uh, to be shown. He's salt. Proverbs 25 9 says, Debate thy cause with thy neighbor himself and discover not a secret to another. When we have an issue with people, in discussing things, <clears throat> we should be the kind of people to really be salt, to not make it known how well we are helping so and so out. Well, you know, they asked for me to don't uh, remember. We need to pray for so and so, and and I'm going to talk to them, and and uh, um, and I I'm, I'm going to really be the helper for them, and uh, we don't have to tell everybody about how God's using us. We just need to do it. If we're really going to be salt. Proverbs 17, 9 says, He that covereth a transgression, transgression seeketh love. But he that repeateth a matter separateth very friends. The Christian is not uh, uh, one, a, a Christian who is being salt. Is not someone who is continually uh, bringing up uh, offenses and bringing up trouble. He's one who is um, covering them. Not talking about it. It's not a big. He's not letting other people know about the issues that are going around. He doesn't bring up the transgressions. Not to say he's being lying, but he just doesn't make it the front and center with uh, the conversation. Because when he does, he separates friends. Galatians five twenty six says, "Let us not be desirous of vain glory." Provoking one another, envying one another. See, this is within us. The Bible says our, the spirit in us lusteth to envy. <laughs> it's just the way we are. See, a Christian is not perfect. He's just forgiven. But a Christian is saved. And saved, that means you're going to heaven. You're saved from hell. And you're saved for a purpose. Or saved for a purpose to reach other people to get them to go to heaven as well. Share the gospel. But also we're saved to be a, a, an agent of bringing comfort and, and strength and uh, uh, um, encouragement. Not that we show ourselves to be somebody. No. That's, that matter of fact, that's odious to people. No. Salt is not only permeates and is invisible, but it, it's therapeutic. Salt heals. Uh, and in order for it to heal, you know, if you have a wound, one of the best things you can do uh, when it gets open and it's got bacteria that can easily, quickly get into that is put salt on it. And salt will, um, will, uh, will kill the bacteria. Now, um, uh, so, so the salt needs to be applied and on, the, on the corruption. Uh, before there's going to be any healing. And the Christian needs to be willing to go to the ungodly. The Christian needs to go where the real needy are. The Christian needs to go in the unpleasant places because there's people there in need, wounded people, hurting people. They need the salt. They need the salt, the therapeutic effects of salt. Uh, Galatians 6, 1, chapter uh, 6, verse 1 says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, 
Ye which are spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear you one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. See, the Christian is to go toward those who, are, who have fallen, who have been overtaken in some fault, sin, some uh, problem. Not to condemn them, not to wag their finger at them, but to find out how can I be an assistance to help this brother or, uh, or maybe even a lost person? How can I help them? That's the way the Christian should be. We should be like the Good Samaritan. Jesus gave the parable of the, of the Good Samaritan, which everyone uh, <clears throat> should know about. But really, it's, a, it's, a, it's an indictment on religion. That whole story is an indictment on those who are religious, who just pass by the hurting, uh, the man who is uh, robbed and left half dead. And uh, uh, it was the priest that came by, it was the Levite that came by, very notable religious men. And they were too busy to stop. Religious. They went to church. They believed in God. They believed the Bible. But they didn't have time to help a hurting person. Not my job. Or not my time. I don't have time. I got more important things I got to take care of. More important things, I got to take care of me. But the Samaritan was an outcast in society, at least in, up in some circles. And the Samaritan, he's the one, took his time, and it cost him money, and he even came back again to help a hurting man. You know what he was? You know what that good Samaritan was? He was salt. Salt. That's what we're supposed to be. His salt is therapeutic. In Jude chapter 21, uh, I'm sorry, verse 21, it says, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. And of some have compassion, making a difference, and of and others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. Wow. What a picture. <clears throat> Here, Jude is saying, we need to really have compassion and mercy on the lost. But boy, are they in a quagmire of filth. And we got to go to get them. Man, and maybe it smells. But we're supposed to go there. What? Well, you're supposed to lift them up out of it. You got to have compassion. Now, I tell you, one thing I know is today we're living in a day where people are living on their feelings. I mean, they, they're, they're, what they do is all based upon how they feel about something. That's dangerous. Now, you can't ignore your feelings, but you better make sure your feelings are grounded in truth because you'll be suckered. There's so many nonprofit organizations out there that play on your feelings and my feelings to get our money, to get our involvement. And maybe they are noble things, but there are so many of them as well. How do you know what to choose? If you follow your heart, you'll be totally wasted. You can't follow your heart. You have to follow your head. Your head in conjunction with your heart, with having compassion, will lead you to what you should do. Really, you can't let your what you like or what your friends like or what makes you look respectable be the criteria for where you're going to be a help. Chances are you might God might call you to go someplace that may make you look disrespectful. You're hanging around with those people? What are you going there for? Oh, are you doing the same thing they're doing? The Bible says that save, it says, save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garment spotted by the flesh. In other words, you better be very careful being in those environments but because you don't want to be uh, contaminated yourself, but we still need to go. 
still need to go. So salt is therapeutic, and we're called to go to where the injury is, where the wound is. Salt, when it's given, when it's applied on those injured people, it may sting at first, but it brings healing. It, sting, it may sting at first, but it brings healing. You know, the person who's a salty Christian, the one who's making an effect on this world, um, it's like the scripture that says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. <laughs> when a friend comes and says something, it hurt my feelings. I said it, but maybe they did it out of love for you because they really care for you. They want the best for you. Some people don't want to go there. Uh, I'm not going to do that. They'll get mad at me. Well, do you really love them or you love yourself more? That's the question. Love yourself more. You won't do anything. Oh, no, no, no. I'll just do things where people like me. Then you love yourself. You don't really love them. Proverbs chapter 28, verse 23 says, He that rebuketh a man afterwards shall find more favor than he that flattereth with the tongue. <laughs> I just think about many times the, uh, you know, yeah, I'm not going to get it. Proverbs chapter 27, verse 5 says, Open rebuke is better than secret love. Open rebuke? That, that means public rebuke. That means something is happening that is wrong, and that person corrects publicly what's going wrong. Open rebuke. How dare you? It's so insensitive of you. Now, you really hurt somebody's feelings doing that. Open rebuke is better than secret love. So don't think that... Don't think that the, the salt agency of a Christian is supposed to be this mamby-pamby wimp. No. It's, it's somebody who recognizes, I've got a therapeutic remedy to trouble that's going on. And it may, 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 not, may not be received well. But it's got to be said. It's got to be done. Salt is added also on purpose. The Christian must be proactive in the world. In other words, you just don't wait for the circumstance to come. We go and we, we, we notice the, the need and we go to it. The world is searching. The world is searching for answers and help all the time. But they rarely ever expect it to be the answer being Christ or a Christian helping them. <laughs> that, that, that can't be the answer. Oh, Christian knew no, that, that we, we, yeah, we know about Christians. That can't be the answer. Oh, yeah, we know about the Bible, but that can't be the answer. Oh, we know about Jesus, yeah, but that can't be the answer. That's what the world says. And we're supposed to show them different. Colossians chapter 4, verse 6 says, Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how you ought to answer every man. Listen, our conversations, our texts, our emails, they should all be seasoned with salt. Therapeutic. They should be uh, 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 helpful, flavorful, encouraging, creating peace. Now, sometimes there's war, but our ultimate goal is peace. They should show concrete certainty in what we are speaking. In other words, <clears throat> we shouldn't be trying to make peace by agreeing with all the different sides. Well, I agree with you, but they said something different. Yeah, but, but I agree, but, but I can understand your point too. And, and I agree with your point, it's different than them, but I agree with their point too. See, I agree with everybody, I'm making peace. No, you're not making peace, you're making confusion. It's confusion. How do you make peace? You know what's right. You gotta do your homework maybe, you gotta, but you gotta find out what, what's happening here. What's the, what's the story? And you got to know what's right. If all you're doing is trying to placate people, make them feel good, you're not really causing peace. You're causing confusion. There's no help. 
Peace is knowing what you're saying is the truth. First Peter chapter four, verse 11 says, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. <laughs> wow, that's a challenge to us. That means that when we're speaking, it should be just like what the Bible says, the oracles of God. Thus saith the Lord. And then, and then, as a matter of fact, that's how we should speak. <clears throat> when we have an opinion about something, who are we to have an opinion? What does God say about it? My opinion is no better than your opinion. Yours is no better than mine. Your viewpoint of something it may be totally skewed. Mine may be totally skewed. What does God say? We need to be, what we're speaking needs to be as the oracles of God. In Titus chapter 2, verse 6 and 8, it says, Young men, Likewise, exhort to be sober-minded in all things, showing yourself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to save you. The, you know, our yea should be yea, and our nay should be nay. We shouldn't be double-minded. We shouldn't be confusing in our speech. It doesn't help people. We're supposed to be salt. Salt also not only is has a um, as an added uh, ingredient on purpose. It's therapeutic. Has some kind of fla has flavor to it. But salt is a preservative. It's interesting in the uh, <clears throat> again in the Old Testament the way the salt was used in the offering. Um, eating the bread and salt together, bringing a syrup. Uh, of being in the ceremony, which finally ratified an agreement or covenant, as it still is in Arabia, salt was associated in the mind of the Israelite with the thought of a family established, I'm sorry, a firmly established covenant. Each time, therefore, that the priest strewed the salt on the offering, that would have been a reminder of all the concerned of the peculiar blessing enjoyed by the nation and all the members of it of being in a covenant relationship with God. In other words, when the salt was applied to the offering, the meat offering, and sacrificed by the priests, the, the, the salt signified a permanent contract that God had with those people. And the, the, current, the, the contract was, your sins are forgiven, I'm your God, I'm never gonna leave you nor forsake you. What a great, what a great uh, a symbol that God's saying, I want this salt, I want all the offerings to give the people the assurance that I'm not going to break my word. God doesn't break his word. The salt sacrifice addressed was addressed to the sinner as a seal and permanent promise from God. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is the seal we have today of that our sins are forgiven. He is the true, Jesus is the true salt. Salt preserves. Salt gives freshness, lastingness of the, uh, of the, of the food when we put it on there. Uh, I can tell you stories. I used to work in a delicatessen. But, uh, <clears throat> and so there should be a preservation of life when salt is added. Listen, when salt is added to a... Um, uh, I should say, well, I'm going to forget the illustration, just, just go into that Christ himself is that salt. And he brings eternal security to the sinner when he comes to salvation. And, let, and this is what I mean by that, is that when, when we trust Christ as our Savior and we get saved, we can't lose it. We can't lose it. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Do why? Because God seals it. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter uh, uh, two, um, yeah, it says we're sealed. I'm sorry, Ephesians chapter one. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. God uh, has um, ma made a contract, if you please, to say that once we come and receive Christ our Savior and trust Him and only Him for the forgiveness of our sin. Then we have complete forgiveness because Christ's blood that was shed on the cross paid the sin debt that we owed. 
We trust in that by faith. And by faith, you're saved. We're saved by grace through faith and not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Let's say man should boast. So we have this gift that's given to us. And it's promise. The signification in the Old Testament was salt. It's permanently done. The contract is sealed. Sins are forgiven. What a beautiful picture. But you know, the preservation of the, of the um, offering, it does more, uh, I should say, salt also. When we receive Christ, that's our, for our salvation. But I recognize this too. There's some, when we receive Christ and we live for Jesus, there is also a preservation of many things in this life as well. One of the dearest things in our lives is our family. And you know, when people don't have Christ, they may be religious, they may believe in God, but they don't really have Christ as their salvation. Their salvation, they may say Jesus, they may celebrate Easter and Christmas and all that, go to church every Sunday, every day. But they don't have the assurance of salvation because they're not trusting in Jesus, they're trusting in their religion. They're trusting in themselves and their devotion, not in the finished work of Christ. And when people are like that, that's the way I was. And, and, and when people are trusting in that, and they're trying to hold on to those precious things in life, like family. It's like holding on to sand. It just slips through your fingers. You can't preserve it. It's gone. If they just, your family members just go separated. And as the older you get there, we, we get more separated and separated and separated. I don't care how close you were from the beginning. You're left with maybe one or two that you're, you know, you call on the holidays. But when you have Christ, when all those members or the members that do trust Christ, your Savior, you have something stronger and more persevering and more lasting in the relationship than you do of blood. And that's the blood of Christ. And it's a new family. The spiritual family. And having that uh, um, is just, um, it, it's, it's preserves your, it preserves the family. I remember my family. Was when I was, a, I was a young man, when I got saved around the age of 20, <clears throat> before, I was the age, before I was 20, 19, around there. And uh, I could see those early days, at least the way my heart was, just gravitating away from the family. I, I come from a family of eight, eight kids, 10 people. <clears throat> family drifting apart. Actually, it was driving my mother nuts. She was an old world lady from Italy. And she was just, how, you know, how am I going to keep all these kids together? You know, she wanted us to develop, but she wanted to keep the family together. It was very difficult for her to uh, grapple with, but um, to tell you the truth, it was impossible. You're, 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 going, against, you're going against nature. You're going against the, the corruption in this world. It's going to overtake you. How do you... How do you keep something that's beautiful preserved? You have to put Jesus Christ in it. That's what exactly happened to me. Jesus Christ went into me. Jesus Christ went into my individual <clears throat> uh, uh, brothers and sisters. Jesus Christ went into my mother. And eventually he went into my father. And boy, I tell you, we had a new family all over again. A new family all over again. Stronger family. Preserved. Like the salt, it preserves. That's what God can do for you. In any in any situation where there's where there's the natural corruption of this world that takes place, the need for salt is great. What that salt does, or should I say, when the Christian becomes the agent of salt in in the life in in this in this world, this where the Christian we are the salt of the earth. He said. When we become that, we will bring men and women and boys and girls to Jesus Christ. That's how we win the world, by being the salt. Churches don't last because the Christians aren't being salt. And soul, again, souls are preserved by this salt. 
It says in uh, Jude, again, in the, in the book of Jude, verse 24, it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, and to present you faultless before his presence and his glory with exceeding joy, to the one and only wise, only wise God, our Savior, be glory and dominion and majesty and dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. The only one that can keep us from falling. The only one who can keep us from decaying. The only one who can keep us from losing our salvation is the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the preserving agent. It's by his sacrifice that he saved us. Have you trusted Christ as your Savior? Have you received him as your Savior? That's the big question. That's the most important question. Do you know for sure your sins are forgiven? Do you know for sure that you're going to heaven? You say, well, nobody can know that. Yeah, you can. In 1 John 5, 13, it says, these things are written that you may know you have eternal life. So, well, who do you think you are? You think you're better than other people? No. Nope. I think I'm a sinner. I deserve God's judgment. But I'm not going to heaven because I'm a perfect person. I'm going to heaven because I accepted the free gift that God's offered, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if I'm going to go to heaven anyway, it's going to be by his uh, preserving me to be there, his for cleaning me up, uh, making me sin, uh, sin, sinless in his sight. Now, practically speaking, I'm a sinner, but in his sight, I'm looked at as sinless. Through the, looking down at the grid, the grid of through Jesus Christ's blood, he looks at me and he says, I'm sinless. Now, I don't understand that, but that's exactly what the Bible teaches. That's how he looks at me. Sinless. I can't understand that because I know I'm a sinner. In practicality, I'm a sinner. But I'm looked by him as sinless. Why? Because I put my faith, trust in what Jesus did for me. Have you done that? Have you trusted Christ your Savior? If you haven't done that, you need to do that, even today. You know, I took out a life insurance policy, a renewed life insurance policy just the other week. <clears throat> and they a life insurance policy. There's no life insurance. <laughs> um, we're going to die. It insures money. That's all it does. It insures, they should call it a, 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 um, a money insurance policy. That's what they should call it. This doesn't go to me. It goes to my wife or my kids, whatever. Uh, a money insurance policy. Not life insurance. You can't insure life. You can't guarantee this life. It's gonna die. It's gonna go. It's it's ultimately gonna go. The only life insurance for man is in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and His grace. That's the only life insurance. You want a life insurance policy? I just took one out. They saw life insurance policy. The real life insurance policy is trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. You need to do that. You need to do that today. He that believeth on me, Jesus said, shall never die. <laughs> That's a great life insurance policy. You believe it? You believe it? Trust him as your Savior today. You pray like this. Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. Because I'm a sinner, I know I deserve your judgment. But Lord, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for my sin. And now the best way I know how, I trust you as my Savior. I no longer trust in my religion, my good works, all the... Uh, uh, religious ceremonies, good family upbringing, those things that I would pride myself on, Lord, I count them as nothing compared to what Jesus has done on the cross for me. And I believe he rose again from the dead after three days and three nights. Lord, thank you for offering free salvation and accepting me as your child today. Help me, Lord, to live for you in all thankfulness and gratefulness for this great salvation accomplished all by you. In Jesus' name I pray. Lord, again, I come before you. I pray you help us, Lord, as Christians. Help us to be the salt. Lord, many times we fail and we lose our savor. We lose our flavor. And Lord, we're not really an agent of help. We're an agent of criticism, of complaining, even within our own homes. And God, uh, I pray you forgive us for that. I pray that there would be a renewed uh, determination, Lord, on purpose to be salt in this corrupt world. And Lord, we see it not getting better. 
as Christians, Lord, we, we know what's going to be taking place. We know how things, um, how the, the world and the culture turns more and more anti-Christian. But Lord, we don't have to be uh, part of the, um, or go down the drain with the rest of the culture. Lord, we should be uh, the agents of, uh, of bringing even peace, joy in the midst of it. Uh, God, for we have much to be re rejoicing about. Lord, our, our, uh, our citizenship is in heaven. Our, um, our, uh, our, our life is hid in Christ. And so, God, we just pray that um, help us to have this renewed vision of who we are and our purpose to be salt in the earth. In Jesus' name I pray. I thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, I went a little bit over time, which is nothing new. But I trust you'll have a, a blessed day. And for those of you who have a, a day off tomorrow from work, uh, maybe you spend time with family or friends. Um, again, I'm not sure what the requirement is, 5, 10, uh, something like that. But uh, um, you have a good week, and we'll see you next week. Lord bless you. Amen.